thank you for joining. If this is your first time, you're actually fortunate enough to join us for um, the one of our final sessions. So um, we'll have a link at the very end to share where you can check out the rest of the conversations that we've had in the series. But this is the Green Your Neighborhood Community Forum. This is an annual event hosted by Sierra Club Michigan chapter and Friends of the Rouge. Um, and this series really aims to both highlight some of the green infrastructure improvements happening around the city of Detroit, but to also empower residents um, to begin to think about green infrastructure challenges and actually take action towards um, creating a, a, a solution to stormwater pollution. And with that, I would like to share a bit about each organization. So my name is Elaine Elliott. I am with the Sierra Club Michigan chapter, and we are a environmental nonprofit organization that works with volunteer leaders, state, le state agency, and the legislator for better environmental stewardship statewide. Um, and our areas of focus really center around clean water and air, wild biodiversity, and a safe energy future. And I'm joined here today um, by my colleagues at Friends of the Rouge. Um, you, see, you will see Jackie Heikula um, with Friends of the Rouge joining us this evening. Jackie and I will both be managing the chat. Um, and the Friends of the Rouge is also an environmental nonprofit whose mission is to restore, protect, and enhance the Rouge River watershed through stewardship, education, and collaboration. Um, so if you don't know, no matter where you live in, in Michigan or in the United States, um, you are in a watershed. So if you live in Detroit, we are bordered by the Rouge watershed on the west um, and the Lake St. watershed on the east. And today we have a really exciting conversation that looks specifically at um, green stormwater infrastructure in placemaking projects and how some of the institutions in the Detroit Cultural Center are really working um, to create a, a, a solution to stormwater pollution. And with that, I'm going to introduce our moderator for tonight's conversation. Today, Sam Lovall will be joining us as a moderator. He is the project manager for Friends of the Detroit River. He has over 35 years of professional experience of professional landscape architectural experience in design, construction, and grant writing for park, riverfront, trail system, urban planning, and environmental planning projects. In addition to instructing planning, in addition to instructing planning and landscaping architecture classes for Michigan State University. He performed as project manager for numerous riparian planning projects in Southeast Michigan, including the development of the master plan for the Rouge River Gateway, the Detroit River International Wildlife Refuge Gateway site, and an opportunity assessment for the Lower Detroit River. Most recently, Sam is serving Friends of the Detroit River as project manager in completing Great Lakes Restoration Initiative projects funded through NOAA at several locations in the Detroit River. And with that, I'm going to pass it to Sam to kick off our conversation tonight. Well, hello everyone and, and thanks Elaine. And thanks for that introduction and, and inviting me to join you with this program today, which should provide a great update on current plans for green stormwater infrastructure management installations in Detroit's cultural center. It will be exciting to hear from the highly experienced lineup of speakers you've organized that will focus on both recent improvements at the, at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History and, and current plans for the Cultural Center. For the segment focusing on the Wright Museum, we'll be hearing from Leslie Tom, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer at the museum. And um, Leslie's work combines technical aspects of architecture with museum visitor staff experiences embedded, embedding African-American stories of climate justice into uh, the museum systems. She focuses on the future of green museums, community engagement, service design, and behavior change. In 2019, she led both the Wright Museum and the Michigan Science Center to win the, the American Alliance of Museum Sustainability Excellence Award. 
In Leslie's spare time, she co-chairs the Venues and Museums Detroit 2030 District Subcommittee and is chair of the Knowledge Committee for the American Alliance of Museums, Environment and Climate Network. She participates as a Land and Water Works mentor and in the U U.S. Green Building Council, Detroit Sustainability, Detroit Forum Conference Committee, and as a community action team member for the West Riverfront Conservancy. Joining Leslie will be uh, Patrick Judd, and he will be talking, of course, about the um, improvements at the museum from a designer's perspective. Patrick is the group manager of ECT Ann Arbor's Landscape Architecture Green Infrastructure Studio. His body of work integrates natural cycles, balanced systems, and co-benefits into built environments across all scales, from urban pocket parks to large regional parks, corporate campuses, commercial sites, Native American lands, trail systems, and whole systems farm planning. Patrick is well-versed with Mid Midwest native plant communities and green, green stormwater infrastructure, allowing integration of ecosystem services into built projects. His combined knowledge about native habitats, site programming, and social interfaces leads to a high performing site design criteria for the preparation of sustainable site master plans, all the way through to construction. Patrick serves in a host of regional leadership roles that include being on the Great Lakes Commission's Green Infrastructure Champions Advisory Team, the Great Lakes Stormwater Collaborative Leadership Team, the U.S. Green Building Council, Detroit Sustainable Detroit Forum Conference Committee, a board member emeritus of the Wildflower Association of Michigan, and a guest lecturer on a wide range of GSI topics. Patrick also participated in and delivered lectures outside of the United States that included speaking in, on wetland conservation at the International Wetland Conference at Tainan University in Taiwan and for the city of city planning officials in Taipei in Taiwan. So as the program transitions to discussion about the cultural center, Anya Sirota will start things off. Anya is an architectural designer and educator along with being the founding principal at Akawaki, a Detroit-based practice specializing in public space and cultural infrastructure. She teaches at the University of Michigan's Taubman College, where she also serves as associate dean. Her work, situated, situated at the intersection of architecture and urban design, explores how a distinct synthesis of aesthetics, social enterprise, and cultural program programming can offer contemporary and multidisciplinary strategies for both ur for, for urban transformation. Her ongoing research and design efforts for many recent projects have received international recognition. recognition. In, in addition, she is a recipient of multiple awards, including the Architecture League Prize, the ACSA Faculty Design Award, the S XSW Equal Play Place by Design Award and the R plus D Award from Architect Magazine. Sirota regularly contributes to international lectures and panels and workshops and expositions addressing socially driven architectural practice and its impact on, on cities. Anya earned her master in architecture from Harvard's Graduate School of Design where she was awarded the Al Raldo Kasuda Prize for Design Excellence. Then as we move into the, um, the Cultural Center, we'll hear from Dr. Donald Carpenter. Dr. Carpenter is Vice President of Drummond Carpenter PLLC and a Professor of Practice at Lawrence Technological University. He is an accredited green design professional and practicing professional engineer whose expertise includes green stormwater infrastructure, stormwater management, hydrologic modeling and design, and field data collection. Dr. Carpenter has 25 years experience working with diverse clients across the United States as a researcher and practicing professional. As a National Charette Institute Certified Community Engagement Specialist, he has extensive experience in, in community engagement and planning. 
His efforts have facilitated community implementation of stormwater master plans and the development of community socioeconomic sustainability plans. As founding director of the Great Lakes Stormwater Management Institute at Lawrence Technological University, he conducts research on innovative infiltration based stormwater practices and advises communities on how to implement GSI. GSI. Okay. And finally, Dr. Carpenter is an active board member on several educational and nonprofit boards and serves on the board of external reviewers to advise State of Washington Department of Ecology on stormwater treatment technologies. Thank you so much for the introduction, Sam, and for the opportunity to talk a little bit about our work. I'm I'm just really, I wanna just set the stage that I'm, I feel so fortunate. Um, I'm Leslie, the Chief Sustainability Officer at the Charles H. Wright Museum to be working with Patrick Judd, um, a landscape architect from the Environment Consulting Technology, Inc. Um, it's, it's just been really great to find a partner, uh, thought partner, storyteller, storytelling partner, a listener, to help um, really kind of push all of this green stormwater infrastructure work into um, really helping to shift and change our museum into be becoming um, a platform to tell these stories about water energy waste. So with that, I'm going to continue. So the way we outlined our presentation today is we're gonna give you a little intro about the project. Um, Patrick will talk about natural systems. I'll talk a little bit about the museum visions. Patrick will talk a little bit about nuts and bolts, and then we'll go into the so what and why is this important. Um, so act one, the intro. We are building off a legacy from Charles H. Wright, um, who was an African-American doctor here in Detroit that delivered 7,000 babies. Um, it's such a rich history of creating a multi-generational sort of space um, and connecting really community voices with how we remember history and culture. So that is what we're building off of. And uh, one of the exciting things about working in a museum is that all the work that we're doing, all the efforts and stories and information we're embedding into the public realm is that um, this information is trusted. Museums are one of the most trusted um, spaces to get information more than um, more than all these list here from the research from the American Alliance of Museums. Um, so what we started out doing was uh, all of our work was grant funded by the Herb Family Foundation and that allowed us to get funding from um, the from the Department of Water and Sewer for a, a matching grant and we were able to start to build out some of our green stormwater infrastructure. The last green stormwater infrastructure was fully funded by capital funds, which is great because it meant that our board of trustees um, did the okay to, to move forward with um, sort of funding this in different ways beside grant money. Um, but we started this work with just asking the community sort of what are the connections to water and we did a lot of research, a lot of listening sessions, a lot of working with children, a lot of working with community groups to really start to understand the importance of water. All of this work was done before the Flint water crisis happened. Um, Detroit was already working with so many issues and uh, with water and water um, accessibility that we wanted to be able to capture a lot of those stories um, tied into our project. So we'd, we had um, eight different listening sessions and it kind of epitomized in this Green Museum Town Hall where we were able to uh, learn about some of our guiding principles. Um, and Patrick will talk more about the final green stormwater infrastructure. With that, I'm gonna pass it off to Patrick. Thank you. Um, one of those things that, you know, listening to um, the stakeholders and the community is really being able to then take that and apply that to the Green Stormwater Infrastructure Master Plan that we were uh, beginning to um, build off of um, as part of um, a report that was uh, provided by the city. And with that, being able to apply a natural systems approach, looking at nature and understanding the balances and the harmony of how she operates um, within the natural environment. Next slide. 
And obviously what uh, one of those uh, uh, issues uh, started to come about is we're all aware of climate change and intensive storm events and the amount of flooding that has now taken place uh, throughout the country and then also specifically in the Detroit area and also within those underserved neighbors, neighborhoods that are in uh, part of the Detroit community. And it's a matter of understanding how to manage that water and how to integrate that into the, the uh, right campus. And then how is it that we can also begin to start thinking about how does this become an educational piece, but also how do we express more of the understanding of uh, uh, African history stories and narratives that could be incorporated as part of art and sculptures for each of those practices that, we've, uh, that have been identified on that campus. Next slide. And one of that, what the end result of that after listening to everybody is the Green Initiative Plan, which is part of the initial phases of, uh, of the campus itself. So throughout the campus, we identified close to 17 or 20 different types of practices or interventions throughout the campus that are not only green stormwater infrastructure, but something that can be built off of uh, the site design itself, in which case many of these are built upon some of that listening from the community in creating those stories and those narratives is a part of uh, the sculptural expression or art expression that is uh, uh, throughout this campus. And one of the very first projects that we started off with is uh, with the next slide. And that is the, uh, uh, the Sankofa, uh, working with uh, several uh, elders and understanding what uh, the Sankofa was, which is an Adinka symbol from West Africa. And they're basically, you know, uh, principles of life, that understanding that, uh, you know, to be good, to, to learn, to understand, to be a better person. Uh, with the Sankofa, it's the bird that actually is looking uh, at its back. It represents uh, looking at history in order to understand its future uh, as it moves forward. And the beak itself is very deliberately pointed toward the front doors of the museum as uh, your journey begins here. And then some of the other uh, projects that are uh, part of this effort is we have a, um, we're looking at a green roof that will have a beehive uh, up at the, at the roof. And as part of that expression is we feel that bees are part of the green stormwater infrastructure uh, technologies because they're the ones that pollinate the flowers that are in those biosoils or rain gardens or those soft vegetation. In which case, if you can imagine that you're walking outside your home on the porch, looking out at a rain garden, and seeing a bee that that bee would actually be uh, visiting the uh, beehive at the museum. So we're trying to make that connection to both the educational component of the rain garden and the functionality of it, but also understanding there's a strong connection to the museum. There's other aspects that we're talking about a living uh, 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 woman's well that would be able to collect uh, roof water and to a cistern, the water is treated and then can be uh, interacted with by pumping that water up. And the woman's well is very much a story and a narrative of uh, African uh, communities um, that talk about, you know, decisions are made, uh, uh, dialogue is going on, and part of, you know, that life's beginning of the day uh, gathers around the, the, uh, the woman's well. Next slide. That's you, Wesley. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. So yeah, this is um, sort of the the idea that museums are really special places, and I feel also very fortunate to be have been in a museum and now being able to become a museum professional and learning how uh, museums function and work. And um, it, it became really important as we listened through all these listening sessions to create guiding principles for what we've heard. So now as we move forward with all of our green initiatives, we want to make sure that at the heart of it, from what we heard from um, various people through this experience, is that we are all part of one earth, one water. We're respecting water, and water is a human right. Water is a sacred trust. We are deepening relationships. We, are, we can't do this alone, and we're presenting in ingredients that we can trust among more, among others. Um, all of this was vetted during a Green Museum Town Hall we had um, pre-COVID uh, with about 120 people. And uh, it, it became a space where um, a lot of imagination is starting to happen on how we can really transform our surfaces, our landscapes, 
our building systems, our experiences, our education um, interactions with energy, water, and waste. Um, okay. Patrick. Yeah, now we get into some of the nuts and bolts of, uh, you know, kind of the engineering and the science uh, aside from the art, because we feel that, you know, the people that visit uh, these uh, practices that are on the campus is they're going to be drawn either to the art or to the engineering or the science aspect of each of those uh, technologies. And so we want to be able to communicate that in a way that, uh, you know, they learn from that. Next slide. And so some of that was some of the cost savings and some of the, um, uh, the funding that was provided to whether it was the Herb Family Foundation or well, Ralph Wilson, uh, part of this uh, also started to look at, you know, these two projects that have now been completed, look at the annual cost savings uh, to really start to get that uh, $13,000 annual um, DWC uh, drainage charge down to as, as low as we possibly can. And so in the first two initiate Two, two first initial projects, you know, the annual drainage charge within the sub watershed of the immediate area of the staff parking lot was about $1,733. Based on the amount of water we'll be able to capture and be able to treat, uh, we have been able to bring that down to um, an annual credit of $1,113. With the Sankofa, you know, the annual drainage charge within that immediate drainage area. $1,500 and the uh, credit now is down to six is uh, up to $621 on uh, 2.4 uh, 2.45 acres of impervious surface. Next slide. And some of those uh, other experiences, as uh, um, I pointed out, this is the women's well. There's also, you know, not only just the green stormwater infrastructure, but the importance of soil health and soil. Uh, is a, uh, how it benefits the infiltration of that water, that stormwater that gets in there. And so in the middle slide or middle image, you'll see what we call a, a soil truth wall. So we've captured in, um, you know, the six major soil types that are in the Detroit area prior to pre-European settlement um, in soil disturbance. And then compare that and looked at uh, contrasting to that would be the six major African soil groups that are over in Africa. And one of those part, portions of the uh, education is that one of those soils is a very rich, dark, organic um, soil along the Detroit River, which was once part of a, a wet prairie system, which is actually where uh, Black Bottom uh, neighborhood was uh, built. And so there is kind of that cultural connection to both the soil and also to a neighborhood. Uh, the slide on the left is a recently completed um, staff parking lot where we actually used uh, contrasting colors as well for the striping and for the numbering, because that way from a sustainability standpoint, you're not having to do you know, frequent painting of the stripes or the numbers, which you can think of the paint itself as a toxic material. And why are you repainting? Because it's washing off and eventually getting into our uh, storm system and into the river system. Next slide. And so part of the uh, engineering aspect of it, uh, Drummond Carpenter was the engineer um, that developed, uh, you know, the impervious surface areas for the Sankofa. Um, so that gives uh, kind of the engineering aspect of what this is all about. Um, and it's also something that, you know, when you're starting to design these things, how much water do you really want to think about uh, retaining? Because the other aspect is the more water you're trying to uh, retain and the more the deeper the water or the deeper the stone base goes is costing money. So you have to almost find that sweet spot where it does make it sense on a return on an investment. And that's kind of what we did on the um, staff parking lot is um, kind of balancing out the drainage charge versus the, uh, the return on an investment. In which case the staff parking lot, we were able to get down to about uh, return on an investment in about 10 years. Next slide. Um, so I, I want to extend into sort of our space here in conversation, the so what of these green stormwater infrastructures and all the co-benefits that it started to happen within the museum. Um, so this is not just one element, but this is a series of practices that we're, we're putting onto our campus from a water, energy, and experience sort of level with infrastructure experiences and just involving um, our staff and visitors into our green, our green elements. 
Um, so one of the things that happened is when we started to, to build some of this green stormwater infrastructure, and this was sheet flow for our urban gardens, was that we have um, Camp Africa every summer uh, where, the, where there are students that come in and we worked with Keep Growing Detroit to be able to plant black eyed peas. And these students were able to go see a real live garden built by the Detroit Freedom School students at the time um, and take home a seed that represented the African diaspora. Uh, we also had World Water Day at our museum and we've had um, town halls where you could taste, smell, touch, feel, see stormwater, native plants. And we started to activate a lot of our spaces to provide people a lot of different types of experiences and gather a lot of different people together um, to just like take this energy that started to happen about these green stormwater infrastructure and just bleed it throughout the entire museums, our departments, um, to the point where even our strategic goals from our board of directors uh, started to have sustainability be one of the main goals for the institution. So I feel like all of this is getting baked into our DNA at the museum and it's really exciting. This is an image of when we had a mini grant with the Land and Water Works group where we were able to um, bring in two teachers to help teach uh, middle school students about green stormwater infrastructure and teach the, have them create a book for elementary school students. So here are some images of rough draft of our little beavers. Um, they felt like beavers were hiding underneath the museum and they were, they were able to create um, these natural systems and lend their beaver expertise to the museums as uh, we all built stormwater, green stormwater infrastructure throughout Detroit. Uh, we also had water rain barrel painting sessions in our museum. And we just really started to embrace a lot of these different types of experiences with water, stormwater and, um, and rainfall. Uh, some of our um, colleagues, Charles Farrell was able to um, use some of the Michigan Humanities Council Third Coast Conversations to honor all of the women water warriors for a talk during um, during women's women's month, um, and then just really being able to use our imagination for how we're starting to connect um, Michigan with the conversations of water. So why this is really important is that there are more museums in the United States than there are Starbucks and McDonald's combined, which is a great piece of information. In fact, there, there are 35,000 museums in the United States. Um, and then this just makes it feel like all the work that we're doing, all the stories and um, technologies that we're putting into, into our built environment uh, can be an example for how other museums can also be thinking about shifting their educational spaces and their third spaces into conversation spaces, into demonstration spaces and um, experience spaces to really uh, help the next generation um, connect with, with these current issues. So as a museum, we're also connected to larger initiatives that are happening across the local level, the state level, and national level. We're involved with um, the EPA's Energy Star program, for example. We are part of We Are Still In. Um, so when Trump uh, got away from the Paris Accord. Museums were one of the cultural institutions were one of the people who stood up and said that we are still in. Um, and we we're just really involved in a lot of different um, connections. So um, I hope that this inspires everyone to look at their cultural institutions differently um, as a platform for being able to tell these stories and to invite the public in and to invite the different departments within our in museums to really um, take control of our spaces and be able to use them as, as, um, as an intervention for conversation and learning. Um, and I just wanna point to one more resource, the Detroit Stormwater Hub. Um, all of these green stormwater infrastructure projects are recorded there. In fact, this is a GIS system that records a lot of the um, green stormwater infrastructure projects across Detroit. So I, I encourage everyone to look at this resource so you can take a tour of other green stormwater infrastructures. And I hope you come and visit us. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much, Patrick and Leslie.
Um, now we are going to transition to Anya and Don to talk a little bit about what's going on in the cultural center as a whole. So, um, so this is a quick talk about the cultural center planning initiative. Uh, it, it's an initiative that has been ongoing now for a uh, year and a half, almost two years, probably when we add it all up. But, but what we're really looking at here is this was a, um, an international design competition. It was undertaken, undertaken by Midtown Detroit Inc. and the different cultural center um, institutions. And they went through a multi-phase process. And again, as I mentioned, it was an international design competition of which um, Ajahn Terre, uh, which is a studio out of Paris, and Aqua Aki, which is what uh, Anya represents um, collectively, were the lead planners and designers associated with this. And then uh, Drum and Carpenter were providing stormwater management uh, expertise and consulting as part of the design team. So um, actually, this is some beautiful video of the Wright Museum that we took with our, our drone. I'm going to leave this play for just a second. We don't have a lot of time, but I like how the sun uh, kind of squints off the dome there for a second. There we go. I think that's a nice one. So we don't have time to show all this video. So I'm going to see if I can I want to advance the slides. OK, so we talked about some of the, the landscape elements, right? So the uh, the beautiful part about this is, is I have listened, I've been part of the team from the beginning, so I have listened to Anya talk about this in the past. And um, what they really, uh, what the design team did is they really kind of came up with, with four elements, the square, the necklace, the band, and the ego tone. And each of these serves a different purpose, both to connect the individual uh, stakeholder institutions with each other, to connect it with the Midtown District uh, as a whole, and then also to connect people with the landscape. And so what you'll see is kind of formal interventions along the square um, and then more kind of informal art interventions and uh, stormwater management techniques around the necklace. And the ecotone then is the kind of the native plants and the green stormwater infrastructure that um, kind of brings it all together. And then the band is, is really where the kind of the heart of this district and is where a lot of the uh, programming interventions would happen. So what was the process that they went through? Whether well, it was a three-phase process, right? Initially, it was discovery. Um, that's what's in my way. It was um, originally discovery and analysis, right? They wanted to do, uh, we had to do a lot of research on existing conditions. Uh, we had to review a lot of data. We had to talk about a stakeholder. And then it went on to um, the framework and concept development process. And then finally, the, uh, oh, Anya, did you join us? Yes. Oh, excellent. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard what? anything I've said, but uh, I kind of gave the not a word. It was a complete so, dramatic meltdown of my entire computer system. Now I'm so, on a little laptop. Okay, well I'm at the uh, I'm at the this part here. So why don't you take back over so and you can pick up. Thank you so much. And um, Don, can I count on you to keep driving now that you're you're in charge? Absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. So first, my, my deep apologies for this technical um, fiasco. Um, I'm so glad to be back with you. And I'm particularly um, delighted to be part of a conversation with uh, Leslie and uh, with Leslie and, and, and in, in collaboration with the entire Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. Um, the work that that museum is doing is uh, so inspiring for everyone in the district and um, has also inflected the kind of radical possibility in the overlap between narrative, culture, and ecology that's so inspiring to, the, to us in this project. Um, the images that you saw just prior to this are images of our storefront office. And prior to COVID, we had imagined that we would be hosting lots of conversations there. Um, of course, COVID changed everyone's plans. So in response, as an interim solution, we've launched this uh, online platform called ccpi.online. And Don, if you press the button again, you're gonna, going to get a little bit of a video. Um, and so uh, this platform is essentially an, an in-progress pinup board. So if you visit uh, this, this website, you can toggle between different themes and topics and see the research and the efforts and the collaboration with all of the stakeholder institutions as they develop in progress. 
And if you hit the, the slide one more time, you'll get the next to the next one. Um, this, uh, this platform also hosts conversations uh, with artists, residents, uh, ecologists, uh, and others who are inflecting thinking about what the district could look like, what shape it could take, and what narratives we need to take into account as we continue developing the plan, the guiding plan. So uh, thank you. So uh, Don probably introduced this idea that at the, um, at the competition phase of this project, we did something very unusual for architects which is we did not provide um, a solution that was a formal solution. Instead, we offered a series of elements that could be calibrated and adjusted to the needs, aspirations, and plans of all 12 stakeholder institutions. And the first element that we introduced was something called the square, even though it's in the shape of a awkward rectangle. Uh, but what it attempted to do was unify all of the institutions and have them connect frontally to an element in the landscape that was pedestrian friendly. So if we move quickly through a few of the images that resulted through our ongoing discussions with all of the institutions, we begin to see how the square allows each institution to begin to occupy the public realm. This is an image of Kirby Street to the left. You, you, oh, sorry, <laughs> that was a little fast. Oh my gosh. Today is like technology gone mad. Um, in this image, we'll move on to Farnsworth. In this image, we're standing in what is currently the parking lot of the uh, Michigan Science Center. And we're looking back toward the DIA with the Rackham building on the left. And we see Farnsworth transformed into a shared pedestrian street. Um, where the activities of the institution can spill out into the public realm and begin to activate uh, the public realm, public space. And uh, we've worked, uh, even if we go back to the other image, um, we've worked with smaller institutions. This is an, uh, the, the, the slide just before um, is an image of the, the entry condition to uh, the International Center. And so we see how bringing some of the activity of the International Center here, namely uh, the, World, the World Cafe, which is currently in the basement level of the, of the institution, up to the ground plane and connecting it to the square and its relationship to CCS begins to occupy the landscape uh, with collective activity. And in the next image, we're looking at the square. Um, from CCS. And in the, in the background, we see um, the sculpture on axis that's in front, that's at the entry condition to the Charles H. Wright Museum and the threshold into the district connecting to Warren. Um, we're exploring ways that water can be rendered explicit, how the space of the automobile can be returned to the space of human, and ecological and biodiverse activity. And in this image, what we're seeing is the um, entry into the district from a proposed underground car park. And here um, we're looking back at the Detroit Historical Museum also on uh, West Kirby this time and testing what it would look like and what it would feel like to begin to occupy the square with cultural programming from within the institutions. In other words, erasing some of the threshold conditions that keep inside in and outside out, uh, but allowing those things, uh, those activities to blur. This, this relationship between the reimagined street and the ecological zone, which we've called the ecotone, is made possible by creating a buffer zone in the district that unifies all of the distinct institutions by caring for the landscape. And if we move on, um, this is the space where we've inserted water management infrastructure, not as something that's hidden or underground, but something that's rendered explicit, beautiful, and um, contributes to the quality and capacity of the landscape to sponsor human activity and to sponsor art, culture, and gathering. So the ecotone uh, 
acts is coordinated with a meandering path that we call the necklace. And as we move through this um, to the next slide, we see how that path goes through spaces that are both more open-ended and incorporate uh, wild native vegetation, along with more planted and more didactic um, learning opportunities about how water infrastructure can work. In the next image, this is something that we're calling the climate machine, which is uh, an opportunity to densify some of the vegetation. In that image, it was um, vegetation that we've, we've begun to test uh, could capture and mitigate uh, stormwater runoff in what is currently the parking lot of the Michigan Science Center. The next image is a section of how we believe that this might work. In essence, the street uh, that's converted into the square becomes a kind of levee in order to capture rainwater both from the roofs of all of the institutions and then to drain it away uh, from the landscape within 72 hours and avoid uh, transmission of that stormwater runoff into the combined system. And the other unifying element in the district is called the band and it's a generous green space uh, that moves axially from east to west and offers a series of plazas, ephemeral uh, and otherwise, where people can gather for large scale events. So as we move through these images, this is the, the band where we join the landscape between the Wayne, Wayne State's um, master plan, Wayne State's entry into their campus through Prentice Hall and the back of the um, Detroit Public Library. Again, terracing that space for human occupation. And working with uh, the terracing and open space in front of uh, the Detroit Public Library in order to reimagine how we might begin to occupy Woodward uh, with public programming if we were to slow down traffic on Woodward to human speed speeds. And transforming Woodward into an ephemeral plaza by reducing traffic to two lanes going north and two lanes going south. And then again, creating more occupiable space that renders explicit the water management infrastructure and, and relationship to landscape and ecology. If we go to the next image, we see that sometimes on rare occasions, this kind of infrastructural transformation would allow us to um, host large scale events on Woodward itself, transforming Woodward very temporarily into a public plaza that unifies the facades of the Detroit Public Library with the DIA. Finally, the back of the DIA or uh, the John R. entrance to the DIA. This is an image that transforms the above ground car park uh, into a great lawn for public activity, but also one that, it's per this, that is permeable and contributes to um, drainage of stormwater in the district. Of course, all of this is contingent on building an underground car park uh, to manage the flux of automobiles into the district for the next five to 10 years. So these elements, if we keep moving, are unified by a lighting plan that's been introduced by 818 architecture, uh, lighting architects, and they're paying exquisite attention, not to just light lighting the pedestrian way where you can see the square is brightly lit uh, for safety and security, but also if we move to the next image, carefully lighting uh, the vegetation itself in order to augment the natural color in the seasons by using different uh, levels of Kelvin heating into, in, the, in the lights themselves. So always augmenting the quality of, of the vegetation and the natural environment. And as we move through these slides, uh, we wanted to talk about the district's impacts and what this plan does overall. If we move to the next image, we have to take into account that post pandemic city centers are going to look very different than the ones we knew prior to pandemic. Um, research estimates that about 20 to 30 offices, office spaces are not going to reopen. So if we move to the next image, the great question of how to activate and uh, bring us together in city centers turns to culture in many, in many ways. Uh, to illustrate that um, there is a way for us to, to move forward if the opposition, the, the normative opposition between work 
and living space uh, don't hold true in the, in the future. So cultural districts, cultural centers, museums, as Leslie underscored, have never been more important as centers for us to share narratives, experiences, and to keep us human. If we move to the next image, connectivity and access are also incredibly important to keeping us together. And if we move to the next image, the great challenge of this district is that it's cut by three major north-south north -south vehicular thoroughfares. So uh, we're planning to make a more pedestrian friendly uh, district by slowing down the traffic uh, to, uh, to a human centered scale um, and making it easier to uh, traverse the district east-west. Public space brings us together and that's a critical aspect of this project. And if we move to the next slide, the reality of this district is 40% of its current land use is dedicated to cars, to the automobile. And despite the fact that uh, you know, Detroit is Motor City, how do we return some of that landscape to human occupation and to biodiverse needs? If we move forward to the next slide, we're looking to consolidate parking in the district to two underground car parks, one existing car park at the DIA and one new car park uh, that's, that would be situated in back of the Charles Wright um, that, would, that would return 16 acres of uh, land to human occupation. And then finally, the environment brings us together. And if we move to the next slide, currently, 60% of the district's landscape is impervious. And certainly the Charles Wright is contributing excellent thinking and action to rendering more of that hardscape pervious, but we need to do more. So if we move to the next slide, we're hoping to transform 15% of the hardscape to a pervious surface. And this plan, as Don Carpenter is going to, to describe, will help us manage stormwater runoff for the 10-year flood. Okay, so by making water management infrastructure visible and beautiful, we're hoping to create a more diverse and empathetic urban environment for, uh, for future generations. And this is where I turn it over to you, Don. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so a lot of uh, the stormwater management um, has already been covered by the previous speakers, but uh, just to somewhat reiterate and to somewhat bring it home, uh, one of the issues is that Detroit has combined sewers, right? And so a vast majority of the city system has stormwater and sanitary water intermixed. And then that water uh, will sometimes overflow, right? And so combined sewer overflows is one of the things that we are trying to address through this project and others in the city. And so as um, Anya already mentioned, we looked at the uh, ratio of pervious to impervious area in the district to try to see who's contributing, uh, because the idea would be if we start looking at this, not in, even though we started by looking at individual institutions, the goal is to look at the district as a whole. And so we went from kind of talking to each institution about their impact, their footprint their, that they're having on their scent at their site and moving that into, okay, let's think about this more holistically at the district wide scale. And I think this is a, an interesting, uh, interesting slide in that um, the city of Detroit has, uh, in total, uh, we already mentioned that we have, uh, we're designed for roads, right? And so um, there are 870 square feet of impervious road services per every resident, right? So really Detroit residents are responsible through infrastructure, through taxes, through stormwater drainage fees, collectively for mitigating approximately three times as much road runoff uh, in Chicago, right? And so if you look at this, this uh, actual uh, diagram, right, the idea is, if you can kind of see is Detroit's, as you're going up the same amount of population, but look how much more road we have than say Baltimore, Atlanta, Minneapolis, Pittsburgh, right, for, for similar numbers of, of residents. And so that's really important for us to think about, because as Anya talked about, and the, the, she already showed you a lot of the, uh, the, the images, the graphics, what we're looking at doing is, okay, let's get this road offline. Let's make it pedestrian. Let's make it a stormwater uh, access point or resource. And then we start looking at shedding water from the individual institutions into this common area. Okay. And so Anya showed you one cross section. And this is just another cross section. So you've got the, the car center, the Hellenic Museum, the DAA. 
So making these, uh, making some of the roads like Kirby, uh, emergency access only or occasional access, but mostly making them pedestrian. And then um, instead of having a, a situation where the road was the, um, the low point, right? Now the road becomes pedestrian. It's no longer the, the low point, right? We're gonna have that landform in front of the individual institutions. We are gonna maintain the combined sewer system because A, the district's still gonna have sanitary, and B, for when these uh, overflow and they have too much rain, we do want that water to go out somewhere. We don't wanna flood people's yards or flood people's houses. So we'll store the smaller storm events, we'll allow the larger storm events to overflow. And uh, Leslie already mentioned the Detroit Stormwater Hub, which is a great resource. And here's one of the things I think is really interesting or important. Uh, currently, as of three months ago, there were 28 bioretention projects in the city of Detroit. Um, this little dot right here actually represents the ones at the, uh, at the Charles Wright Museum. So uh, these 28 bioretention projects, I'm not talking about all green infrastructure, I'm just talking about bioretention, manage 5.5 million gallons of water annually, right? If we actually implement all of the bioretention that were shown on the images, we're going to be managing 17 acres and we're going to be managing 15.6 million gallons of stormwater annually. So uh, the projects, if implemented in Midtown, would represent a, a three threefold increase in annual gallons of storage. And so the, the goal then obviously, right, is okay, that then is gonna stop those combined sewer overflows, not for the whole city, but at least for the, this district and this portion of the district. So um, the images you've seen and the management that we're talking about through the Charles Wright Museum and then also through the center, um, the CCPI, that'll basically get Midtown kind of off the storm, uh, off the combined sewer overflow grid. We, this area would no longer be contributing to, to combined sewer overflows. And this concept then can be replicated in other parts of the city as well. And so I know we're up against our time. And so I, I thank you. And I'm, I'm sure the other presenters thank you as well. And with that, I'll turn it back over to our uh, moderator. Thanks, Don and Anya and uh, Patrick and Leslie. This, that was great, very informative. We do have a few questions in the Q&A box. Um, Elaine, do we have enough time to take a few of them? I guess we could probably take just one. I know um, Anya has already answered one of the questions. Um, yeah, but we could probably take one. All right. Um, this is always comes up. This is from Ruth. How will the ecotone plantings be maintained? Conventional landscaping uses big mowers trimmers and blowers. Maintaining perennial plants requires a great deal of uh, more manual labor. Uh, I'm not sure who wants to respond to that. Maybe Don. Um, I, have a, I guess a, a quick response and that is um, Midtown Detroit would be looking at basically serving as the uh, maintenance, um, I don't want to say the maintenance contractor, they would look at hiring and educating, uh, kind of stumbling on the answer here, but the short version is, is that the Midtown District would collectively take on the maintenance. So it'd be district-wide maintenance. It would not be institution by institution. And then we would actually look at uh, this as a job training opportunity, right? To bring jobs to city residents to learn about how to maintain these landforms. Oh, that's great. And yeah, certainly um, getting the residents involves, involved will enhance that whole buy-in from for everything that we're doing you know keeping people involved as stewards is great one other one here um, from ruth is about um, light and heat effects from plants blooming cycles so and the cause from bloom out of season so yeah the issue of light i guess that's what she's getting at light and heat effects on these on these mm -hmm. native plants is there any concerns in that regard Yes, we're working extremely closely with um, uh, the, the lighting designers who have uh, quite a bit of experience with these issues and have brought them up. So the, the, the major lighting aspects are all downward facing, they cap light pollution, and uh, they're also uh, incredibly sensitive to uh, the addition of uh, unnatural light or colored light. Um, so they're, they're using uh, low heat uh, lighting techniques. Um, all of the lighting is on dimmers and can be controlled in order not to create extra spectacle when events are not in function. 
Um, so there's really a way that's embedded in their thinking to control the vast gradient of lighting uh, that's, that's necessary for programming and then to, to turn the lights off as much as possible when those are not necessary. That's great, great Anya. Uh, related to that, here's one from Barbara about lights. How is your lighting plan affecting light pollution as well as bird migration impact? Also, is there something being considered to minimize bird strikes against the windows of the buildings? Another great question about, um, about, about ecology and the species that we have to consider um, with all of these projects. Um, the, again, the, the light pollution is embedded in, this, in the strategy for all of the lighting elements. The migration of birds also has to do with the sensitivity and the number of days that there are uh, large scale events with stronger lighting uh, in the district. Uh, at this time, we, can, we've, we are tracking about three to four large scale events per year. So it's kind of a minimum impact in terms of programming on the district. Um, and then bird striking windows, I think there are, um, I would say Root of Two has explored, one of our uh, consultant partners has explored ways that um, sensors and other means of um, uh, creating visual effects for birds uh, might help. But again, that is, um, there aren't, there isn't a whole lot of refurbishment of architecture per se in the plan. We're really focusing on the interstitial space of landscape at this point, uh, but certainly each institution would benefit from thinking about uh, the impacts of their architecture on the collective whole. Excellent. And somebody is joining in, Lori um, is, is, is chiming in that she likes the idea of um, the volunteers with the gardening opportunities. This is for the sake of master gardeners. Certainly with the master gardeners program, there should be some availability of some help there. Um, I would like to thank Sam for being an awesome moderator for this event and each of our panelists. Um, I love the plans that are already happening at the, happening at the Wright Museum as well as the vision for the cultural center. Um, I definitely think making the whole uh, area more walkable is something that folks are really excited about and it's amazing to see um, the unique and implicit ways you all are incorporating stormwater management as a part of these projects. So thank you so much for that. And I'm going to share my screen really quickly before we hop off. And thank you to all of the attendees for joining us for our final session of the Green Your Neighborhood Community Forum. Um, this is the last session in this series, but this is not the last event that the CR Club and Friends of the Rouge will co-host. So we encourage you all to keep in touch with us. Um, Friends of the Rouge, we have their website and their Facebook listed here, as well as uh, contact information for CR Club Michigan chapter. And if this is your first Green Your Neighborhood session and you're wondering what else did, um, what other conversations did the, this organization or these, this collaborative host as a part of the series, you can go to the rouge.org backslash green dash your dash neighborhood where you can find all the recordings um, from the entire series. And with that, I would like to say thank you to everyone and have a great evening. <laughs>